Welcome everyone to the Deep Dive, the podcast that skips small talk and goes straight for the concepts that shape our thinking and behavior. In this podcast, cold expertise is defenestrated as warm philosophy is enthroned in an attempt to explore the field in which we're all scientists looking for answers, living well. Hello world, welcome to another episode of The Deep Dive with Eyal Shai. My guest today is Maria Gurska-Pisek. Hi Maria. Hi Eyal, thanks for having me here. Thanks for coming on. Uh, what is an idea that has helped you or has been helping you live well? Yeah, so today I want to talk about setting intentions and working with intentions in general and how they help me like focus on what matters and And get the results that I want in different areas that's great, so really looking forward to learning more about it and could you tell us a little bit about how um, what problem does it solve for or what problem it has solved for how you um, came to think about setting intentions at all mm-hmm. yeah, so I think. It all started like many years ago when I came back from living abroad and I met some of my former co-workers and colleagues and they told me, oh, you know, by the way, Arthur is looking for a wife. And at that time, like we were pretty young, like 20 something ish. And all of my friends were looking for like boyfriends, girlfriends, parting hookups. And then suddenly like I heard, okay, this guy is looking for a wife, like. Okay, like what is he about? Like what is this about? Maybe I should learn more about him and and you know, like I tried to like talk to him more, and well, we ended up getting married actually so and the funny thing is, like when I find out found out that he's looking for a wife, and I got to know him better at that time, like we were just coworkers before. And I remember telling one of my friends at that time, "You know what? Like I'm gonna marry this guy." And she's <laughs> like, "Well, like maybe like you should start dating him first and then find out if that's gonna happen or not." But because like he was so clear about what he's looking for, it made me think like, is this the kind of thing I'm looking for? Is this where I want to orient myself and where I want to orient my life?" And I realized like, like yeah, like the life he's looking forward to looks pretty awesome. Like I'm not going to come up with anything better than this. So maybe like I should just co-sign his bucket list and do it all together. And so So yeah, he was very clear about his it- intention that he's looking for a wife and for a serious relationship. And none of my friends were like this around that time. And this is what made me interested in him, but also like what made us survive through like this beginning dating period that was it, mm-hmm. it turned out like we were very different people, like a very different past life experiences and priorities at the time and and you know like knowing that he's in for something serious and I'm in for something serious still like made it like really. easier for us to to get together on the same page because we knew that yeah this is what we're looking for and this is our intention in this yeah that's that's amazing so just to make sure I understand like he he's approximately the same age as you we're not talking about somebody who's like been through uh, the cycle of like relationship breakup and all that or so it's really, I'm, I'm just asking like in the context it was quite surprising for him. To kind of talk about a hmm. marriage right Or... yeah like we were both like just freshly out of long-term relationships but n- none of us were married before so okay. there were some friends around that time who said yeah I, I broke up with someone I'm looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend or they didn't even like say it publicly and he was like mm-hmm. very clear that I'm looking for a wife and I want to you Go travel the world with my life and have free kids and do this and do that and he put this whole list of all the things he wants to do with his wife 
on his website. And the list is still up there. And we're just like crossing off the things out of this list. <laughs> so that's, that's great. Yeah. I mean, in my case with my wife, it's, I guess it's a bit different. And I'm going to ask you about setting intentions because it's something that I'm actually um, struggling with, whether it's setting intentions or goals. And I'm always interested in how people manage to do that because it does there does seem to be a, a something like a self-fulfilling prophecy but in my case with my wife it was just that we're very early on decided that there is an intention for us to be friends first and foremost mm -hmm. you know and uh and much in the same way i feel like this has just helped us always you know this is the foundation and the, this foundation is not going anywhere whatever it comes um and we haven't uh, gotten so specific about how many kids or which places exactly to go which is really cool uh but i do feel a sense that um yeah these intentions matter and the expectations that they that they create right and these expectations are going to uh prime you to take certain actions and probably reach where you wanted to go now, there's still a question of, you know, the adage, be careful what you wish for. Oh, yeah, right? for sure. <laughs> so what, what, what about that? Be careful what you wish for? Hmm. I can't think about like a scenario where I wanted something and it turned out to be like completely not what I wanted. Like, I feel like whenever like I'm clear and very honest with myself, about like wh where I want to get and why it all it might not turn out like exactly how I imagined this to look like but it all gets me like in the right direction the only scenarios I can think of where this goes wrong is like when I'm trying to bullshit myself <laughs> so for example like sometimes I'm like yeah, procrastinating on a lot of stuff and then coming up with a lot of excuses like why I can't why I, why I can't work today, why I can't finish this or, or another project. And and you know, if I don't really want to finish this project, I will come up with like so many different reasons why it's not possible and why it's not going to happen. So like sometimes like I work for a kids magazine and I write articles about science and tech for little girls. And it's really hard to like explain hardcore technical stuff in a language that's understandable by a seven year old. So like some of these articles took me like three or four or five rewrites from scratch because like it's so hard to to nail it down. And and sometimes when I sit down to write an article like this, I'm just like, yeah, it's not going anywhere. And and there's just no way I can explain this concept to a kid. And after, you know, like many <laughs> weeks and evenings of struggle, I'm just, okay, like I need to get serious about it. So I light up a candle, light up some incense, take a notebook and just like write down in my notebook, like, what do I want to do and why? Like, why do I want to write this article? Like, what's the message I want to communicate to these little girls? Who do I want them to become in the process of reading it and like applying them in their lives? And the moment like I get really clear about why I want to do this, I find that like usually I just finish this article on the same evening because... I, I set the intention and I'm like really motivated to do it because I know what's the purpose behind it. Yeah, that that uh, resonates with me a lot. Of course, there's the famous, I believe it's Nietzsche, uh, with, uh, you know, a person who has the why. It was like there's the, the, the question of how is going to be. I'm paraphrasing poorly. But if you, if you have the why really... Um, in your mind, then the how is, is quite easy, right? You, if there's a will, there's a way. That's another way of, of putting it. And um, yeah, it's, it's the same with me, with this podcast, because in, in my past, there are a lot of projects that were just dropped along the way, right? And um, suddenly you start something that you have a clear vision about in what kind of impact you want to have on the world. And you still have to engage in some things that are not the thing you love most 
doing, right? If if you like writing, well, maybe you don't really like pitching it to people, or you don't like uh, being an employee rather than rather than a, a self-employed person or whatever. But these things, just if you have a strong intention, they do seem to just sort themselves out and not to become huge issues like they mm-hmm. could have been if you didn't have that. Yeah, I wouldn't say it necessarily gets easy, but it gets more fun. Like <laughs> the difficult parts and the challenging parts become this ramp that gets us forward. So like in my day job too, like it's it's the best job I've ever had and like something I would love to do for free even because like I just get to talk to smart people about stuff they're passionate about. <laughs> so what's there not to like about it? But there's also like all this admin stuff and keeping track of all these conversations that I have and I'm making sure things are getting done on time. And and every week there's a different challenge and there's another thing that goes wrong that I couldn't have predicted before because yeah there there were different challenges in the past and now there's like something new basically every week but also like it's it's frustrating at times and sometimes like i get tired but i never get bored with it you know like i still see the purpose in in doing what i'm doing and it helps me figure out challenges that i never thought i would be capable of figuring out because i never really had a strong why behind it so yeah 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 i i hear you i mean i in the beginning had to like edit things and you know it's not my cup of tea but it's just proved to be something you do and uh, it's not it, it loses its sting on you like it's not um fun but it's not painful right it's just what it takes and uh, the accomplishment and the feedback you get from people saying that you know, well, they enjoy the fruits of your work. That's worth everything that's um, that's on there. Um, yeah, if if we were to um, take a, a broader look at your intentions in in a broader sense, like maybe for yourself or in life, like have you ever um, played with that after marrying Arthur um, and? set intentions like outside of this romantic relationship as Mm -hmm. well yeah that's a good question so a few years ago we went on a yoga retreat for the new year's eve and we did some kind of dream maps where you put all the things you wish are going to happen in the next year and i remember putting a baby on my dream map and feeling like so embarrassed about it (laughs) because yeah, I was like, yeah, I want to have a kid, but I didn't want to feel like very pushy because I I knew my husband like didn't feel like he's ready yet at that time. I I thought he wanted three. (laughs) You know, uh, I thought so too. But now that we have the first one, we're like, okay, let's let's try another one and see how that goes before, <laughs> before committing to the third one. Like maybe we'll get there, but yeah, like even having one kid is pretty intense right now. Yes. But yeah, at the time, like at this New Year's party, like we wanted kids, but we weren't sure. Like, should we do it now or maybe in another year or two? And I felt so vulnerable, just like putting a picture of a baby on this dream board because yeah like, there's no turning back like this is what i want and this is mm. what i announced to this small group of people who are there with me but then like i might be open to ridicule or weird questions or you, you know what i mean mm-hmm. so I, I didn't even know it would be like so intense and personal and vulnerable to do this and and yeah a few months later i was pregnant (laughs) so this worked out pretty well as well yeah sounds like it yeah i mean the the whole issue with kids is so interesting in our society because you know go a couple generations back and people are just having kids it's like what you do i don't know you get married you have kids as many as has come out it's like that's all great you know and in our generation obviously like birth rates are falling below Mm -hmm. the line that allows a population to even sustain its numbers right 
So first of all, it's amazing how we've gone from like, oh no, overpopulation to like, oh no, underpopulation, you know? <laughs> it's, it's amazing. And it, it says so much, I think, about our culture that in a, in a, in a, in a, in a lot of uh, respects, we are hyper thinkers, right, about these things. And for me as well, and, and my wife, it was a, a real question. It's like we just, it's really similar to what you're saying. It's like we know we want it, but is it ever? And then the, there are the moral question of like, okay, you're bringing another soul into this world. The soul is capable of suffering. And yeah, we, we like to do everything for her not to be suffering and be uh, flourishing, but can we absolutely guarantee that no are we going uh, would we feel um blame you know would we feel uh, guilty about it yes absolutely maybe i mean if it's something up to us because we right now have the option not to bring her you know so assuming there isn't a soul in a different world now kind of knocking on the door and say hey let me out and it's like our choice our responsibility what do you do? And this was going back and forth for like a good part of a year, probably. And it just, I think for both of us, it, is, it ended with exhaustion, first of all, because it's exhausting. And maybe with an understanding that you really can't solve everything with thinking, right? And arriving at something that's like scientifically proven to, to be the correct choice. And so... Um, sorry, rationalists out there, but it's like <laughs> some things are just, you don't know. And also as a parent, I feel like the whole um, spectrum of emotions you're going to feel is widened but by a lot, right? Like you're probably going to feel um, unmatched joy. And there is also potential for unmatched sadness because, you know, tragedies do happen. So And frustration uh, and tiredness and <laughs> anger. Yeah, okay. Right. The full buffet <laughs> of all human yes. emotions available. Yes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I know we're both uh, quite uh, young parents and that's also a, a thing with, with intention for our kids. And isn't it especially hard? to set intentions about making them a certain way or not, because there's also their temperament and personality behind that. Oh, yeah, this is a funny thing to explore. So my daughter is like very much unlike me. And it even got me like interested in astrology because I wanted to find out like, why is she so different? So like, mm -hmm. I'm very outgoing and I want to be the center of attention and I want to be among people showing off, making lots of noise. And she's just like, not like that. Like she's very organized. She's very careful. She practices every move before she, she knows, like she can do it right the first time. And she doesn't even want to speak because possibly like she wants to practice the words before she gets them right and it's not like we ever punished her for pronouncing something wrong or we ever gave her like any sort of feedback that would discourage her from talking like that's just the way she is and apparently like my husband's mom was exactly the same way and it's you know, like all the things I thought about, like what means to live a good life for me might not work out for her completely because like she has such a different personality than I do. And yeah, what does it mean to set an intention for her growing up? Like before she was born, I, I thought a lot about like education and like my experience with education was like I had a very intense education at home from my parents who like laid everything in front of me on a golden plate and just like made sure that I sit there sit there with them and practice all of this yeah math and dates and and vocabulary and stuff and it got me like really far like if they didn't do that like I wouldn't probably be where I am right now but I, on the other hand, like I rebelled against it so much because then I went to college and I realized like I can't really learn by myself because my parents did all the learning for me mm. for all my life so far. So 
at one point I was like, okay, I will just let my kid do whatever, just like run around, dig in mud and play with computer games. And if she wants to learn something, like she, she'll figure it out by herself. And now I see like she really craves some structure and maybe it's going to change in a few years because yeah, kids at this age, like are a different person every few months. But, but at the moment it seems like this dream free form unschooling kind of education might not be the right option for, for like this type of person that she is and she, she's growing into becoming. So yeah, it's, it's a really interesting challenge. And I feel like, like the most important thing is like being able to admit when I'm wrong or like I won't be able to avoid mistakes, but at least like I can own up to it and and course correct and apologize and then try try something different and maybe it will work out and maybe it won't. We'll see. Yeah. So if um, I guess the, the intentions set are just... Uh... Could we, I'm just thinking out loud now, but could this be equated with a goal or is, is there something, is there a difference between intention and goal to you? Hmm, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I feel like a goal is something tangible that I do. Like, I don't know, my goal is to do the laundry and or like buy a house in five years or move to a different place or go on a trip like it's it's easy to determine if a goal is achieved or not and with intention it's more about like the direction i want to orient myself towards and the kind of person i want to become in the process Mm, that makes sense interesting so it's more open-ended right yeah it's more open-ended and uh Hmm, I'm trying to come up with a good example of this. So, yeah, a few years ago, I did this exercise, like, trying to imagine myself in, like, five or ten years into the future. And it was really hard. Like, it's really hard for me to think, like, where I'm going to be. Because my life so far was, like, so different from what I've predicted. (laughs) So, if you ask me, like, ten years ago, I would never have guessed what I would be doing now and how my life would look like. But I'm still like trying to to orient myself towards the future. Except married. Yeah, except married. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah. But and I remember... Do you, do, you, do you set goals at all? As opposed to intention? Hmm. I try to sometimes. Yeah, sometimes we have like practical goals, like let's buy an apartment or let's go on an RV trip or let's send Christmas cards to everyone who we know. But goals, like I don't have career goals. I don't have Mm -hmm. development goals. Yeah, it's more about like the kind of person I want to become rather than what particular experiences will get me there and uh yeah so what what kind of person is that um <laughs> uh, nanny og from terry Pratchett's books you know this Ooh, what's that yeah so there are three witches in some of the terry Pratchett's books and like two of them are like very old and they don't give a shit about anything they're just like doing their thing they're loud they're noisy they're enjoying each other but also they're like very wise and connected with the world and like able to to make things happen in the world because of like their understanding of, of how life processes work and nanny og is this matriarch of like a very big family she has like 80 different relatives who live all in the same neighborhood and whenever she wants something done she's like okay family here i am like let's do this and they all like are a bit afraid of her and always like following her advice because they know she's like so wise and so annoying when she's upset (laughs) so yeah nanny og like you know like she's the opposite of the typical older lady. She's like loud and drinks a lot and <laughs> sings inappropriate songs. And, <laughs> and so, she's my um, hero. Like I want to be like her when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
well, just just keep uh, drinking and um, <laughs> yeah, being loud again and and organizing events. I think you're on the fast track of becoming <laughs> your hero. That's no, but good. like more seriously, like um, this is like a very tangent topic to what we're discussing here. But I feel like uh, our culture doesn't really have space for like older people and especially older women. Like they just cross certain age and disappear. And this matriarch figures, in, especially like in, in Terry Pratchett, they show me that like there's another way po- possible that like a woman can still be powerful in her 60s and 70s, but her power is in her relationships. And it doesn't mm. necessarily have to be like blood relationships, but yeah, she has to be have this like connections in her community and family and an extended neighborhood. Because yeah, a single older woman all by herself yeah it's just lost she needs like this whole community behind her yeah i assume that you know just like pretty much everywhere else uh one generation or two it wouldn't have been very um very rare or even common to find houses that uh, that have three generations in them right in poland yeah i i grew up with our grandma living with us Mm. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting because in in Israel, like the the three generation homes are uh, very much uh, they're kind of the the stereotype of the Russian immigrants that came here in the nineteen nineties, and it's people are like saying, oh, it's like that's terrible, you know, it's like not something that that people want, and kind of laugh at the at the immigrants who do it. But first of all, there were it's not just the culture that they came from, but also just the necessity of coming to a new country and, you know, grandma doesn't speak the language and all that. But I always thought that it was completely misguided to um, dismiss that form of living, even though at the same time, I'm part of my generation, and I already can't picture this happening with me in the middle generation, right? So it's really interesting to... Um, trace back the that uh, process that that made us kind of live this way of life and as you say kind of um, keep grandparents uh, or older people away even though I agree there's there's still so much to to contribute there with experience with you know helping share the load and um, it is it is tragic in the way that it's not happening as often but i have no idea how to bring it back in any form because i'm not necessarily comfortable with doing it (laughs) yeah right yeah same with me like in theory like i love the idea like multi-generational homes and like cousins all living close together like i one of my aunts and uncles live in a setting like this like all of the kids live just like in houses right next to each other so there are like many grandkids and children and their wives and and their house husbands and they all live like pretty much on the same parcel in separate houses and the kids like all play together all the time and and it's so lovely but when i think about like okay like should i move in with my parents or my husband's parents maybe not <laughs> there are good reasons not to do that and and like a lot of people have like even better reasons not to do that than, than I do. But what I would like to try instead is to become the sort of parent and also grandparent that kids would like to hang out with. Like maybe not necessarily like live together in the same apartment with the same kitchen and, and everything. But just, yeah, like uh, if I want to be an active parent and grandparent in, in my kids' lives, like. I have to make it happen. Like <laughs> I am the adult here in this relationship, you know. Yeah, and um, yeah, you're right. It's and it's 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 quite hard. Like not many people are manage to put themselves in a position where um, it's easy to approach them uh, for teenagers, for example, right? So I I wonder about that. And since you kind of set the intention of of being that person. Like, do you do you have a plan for that at all? How how to remain accessible to people of of all ages? What what does it take? Do you think? Hmm. 
Yeah, I don't have much experience with teenagers. Like right now, in like around me, there's mostly like little children and young adults, and there's like this gap in between. But the way I imagine this is, is like first of all, like I shouldn't try to impress the teenagers. Like I know a lot of adults who do, and like try to speak <laughs> their language fail, yeah. and look cool and dress oh their their style. Yeah, that's not my kind of thing at all. But yeah, like just yeah. First of all, like be open to learning from them and be open to admitting when I'm wrong, and. And yeah, just like be interested in, in their perspective and their experience and treating them seriously. A lot of people don't treat children and teenagers seriously. And they come with this like proselytizing tone, like here, dear, ch- dear little child, I'm going to tell you everything about the world. And all you have to do is sit and listen. So yeah, I think like this is the biggest mistake people make. It, they, like, they just don't really open themselves to the possibility that they can learn something from the kid. Yeah, absolutely. But and also I another do. part of it is like being actually like happy and confident in like myself growing on older and showing them like growing older is awesome. Like you should try it too. <laughs> and you should try it, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I I I agree. I mean I think that um it's uh a lot of people are turning very quickly now i hear about like 20 20 something year olds who already start with the botox and stuff that sounds a bit crazy but i know it's a it's a real thing um yeah what what else could you tell us about uh maybe where the journey with intentions um developed what it developed into again maybe in your relationship with art or like things that have changed or things that you both realized were there any times where you sat down to write intentions together uh, hmm. because you you realized something about yourself and maybe after a a heart to heart like it emerged that yeah we should steer the ship towards that as maybe as people that's a good question i don't think we wrote them down together like we talk a lot about like where we want to go next as a family and currently like the main challenge is like where we want to live and ideally it should be in the city in the mountains by the sea <laughs> with a lot of <laughs> huge garden and uh, like there are so many different expectations <laughs> and and yeah also close to our family because we want to live in this like whole extended family setting so yeah our apartment is growing smaller and when we have another kid it will be like very very small for us and uh, it would be good to have a long term plan like maybe just like even which city or which <laughs> region of the world we like to settle down in but we don't know like we really don't know it yet and um, how we're navigating this right now is Yeah, just like collecting ideas, collecting um, inspirations from different places and just like being open to changing our minds. And for this summer, we were considering like moving to northern Italy, perhaps. And and now we're like, well, maybe Poland could still work, but somewhere somewhere south of Poland. And hmm, how do we set intentions about this? Yeah, we're just like open to options that we haven't considered before. Like I, we're not getting fixed on any specific vision and just like trying to figure out like what our needs are and what our needs are probably going to be in a few years. Right now, it's easy to like stay at home with, with our kid when she's like still two years old. But when she's older, she'll probably need to have like her own community and her own school and her own friends. And then like moving houses is going to be more challenging. Hmm. Yeah, it's 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 so hard. And um, yeah, it seems we, we share a lot because we're of the same generation and have uh, young children. And 
yeah it's it's been amazingly hard for us to think about which place to to live in because because the options are out there right if there were no options it would have been easier in that sense <laughs> yeah, for, sure. Um, for sure and you know like you say you, you want to eat the cake and, and leave it whole right so the place we would have most liked to live in is just half an hour away from where we live but um houses cost uh, three million dollars there or something <laughs> like that so it's like and uh, well the tragedy is that it, it wasn't like that even 20 years ago we remember a time where you could work toward doing something like that get in the house but as things are changing financially all over the globe and a lot of young people, you know, find themselves just unable to find any kind of um, horizon of, of improvement in terms of quality of like material quality of life. I'm not going to say uh, spiritual quality of life. I think that we have more options than ever there, but um, it is getting hard and it's really hard navigating the different um pros and cons that each place has and I find myself in terms of intentions having to really stick to the fact that these are now if we're going to use the the definition between uh, intentions and goals to really focus on intentions rather than than goals because goals kind of make you cling to one story that you might become fixated on and then if this thing doesn't work, you're suddenly lost because you haven't really thought about many other options. Like you wanted that one thing so badly. Yeah. Um, or sometimes you achieve that goal and you re realize that wasn't it. <laughs> and then you're like stuck with a goal that's fulfilled and you're asking yourself, what, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, you know, the disillusionment is all around us. Like the, the, my joke is that 80% of Twitter is like, software developers trying to save their soul because they were so <laughs> they were so successful in the mainstream sense only to find out that it really mean doesn't mean much to them yeah. and it's like uh, looking at other things but yeah always keeping the the more abstract um, intention rather than the concrete goal because things are changing uh, we're never we're navigating a, a quite a chaotic world these days right and this is true even before covid but it's like this is just what we needed right pandemic too and now everything is uh that's happening with that too um yeah so this know. is interesting it, because growing up in poland like i was born a year before like communism ended here so all my life i would see the quality of life constantly improving and I know this wasn't the case for like many millennials growing up in the US or even Western Europe. Like in my lifetime, like things got like so much better for everyone, like even for my parents, like uh, their quality of life when we had when they had us and their quality of life right now is just like not comparable. And I know like we might be reaching the peak right now. And then like how is my child's life going to look like is she going to have like much more challenging childhood or like much more challenging adult years it's it's really hard to tell like perhaps she will be struggling in similar ways that the million millennials in the u.s are struggling right now or perhaps there will be like completely new perspectives and opportunities that i'm not even aware of and and yeah like thinking about like preparing my child to thrive in the future is also like such a big topic because like I I don't even know what kind of a job I'm going to have in five years. It's probably like not even created yet. And so the more challenging it is to imagine like what kind of skill my child is going to need like 20 years from now when she en enters like the adult world. So yeah, all I can do is like stay open and curious and present with all these different things happening in the world and just like respond to to whatever's happening. So like, right now, like I, I'm really interested in this AI art bots. Like this is going to be huge. I don't know what people are going to make with it, but there, there's going to be like so many amazing things that come out, come out of this AI art. And to my daughter, this will be like the most normal thing on earth. <laughs> Try to explain it to her that people 
couldn't have done this like even two or five years ago. <laughs> this is the world, the way the world works like for her. This is, yeah, normal. To me, it's magic. Right. I mean, you know, more than ever, I think that one intention we should set is to be lifelong learners and people who are able to adapt because this is what the world calls for today. And um, yeah, it's it's really wild what's what's going on now in the in the job market or in the financial market. The best explanation I can come up with, and I'm not an economist, which means that my explanation might actually be good. Um, is that, you know, I think there, there was such, uh, the whole world has such a history of, of, of wealth inequality, right? And it was, it started with like nations and really nations gaining a lot from different nations that they're exploiting with like imperialism, things like that. And then when that subsided, when it's not so much along uh, national lines, then now you have along the technology of people really um, rising to the top, mainly by creating, uh, I'm thinking about the big uh, internet companies like Facebook and Google and uh, and Twitter. But all this connectivity around the world, I think at some point is going to create a world where a lot of the people who come from poor areas are going to be um, lifted oh, from, for sure. from their ignorance about their situation. And they're going to be a lot more vocal in demanding what they probably deserve if, we, if we're talking in moral terms, right? And I think that uh, this, is, this could be what we're seeing now because a lot of the... Uh, material kind of extravaganza that's been going on in the West kind of depended on people in poorer countries just being happy, like m more of, of not knowing what's going on, right? They're just there in the in the sweatshop or whatever. They don't really know what what's going on. And as more and more people know what's going on, I, I feel like there's going to be... Um, yeah, just calls for more equality and the pe pendulum is going to swing and kind of fill that area of the pool with all the water from the big pool that's now all wealthy and such. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope the metaphor yeah, is good Yeah, at enough. the same time, I feel like uh, the internet is opening like so many possibilities for people to lift themselves up without waiting for someone to come and make things equal. Uh, yeah. You know, like I taught myself like so many things on the internet just because I had this internet connection. And, and same like with, with my brothers and my family, like we all have jobs in tech. And for our parents, like how much they would have given to have like all this access to all this information when, when they were in college or like entering the, the job market. Like they had to go to a library to figure out stuff. And now like you, you can go on YouTube and learn basically pretty much any skill, like from knitting to woodworking to plumbing to, to everything. And not to mention like coding that's like available everywhere. And um Especially, like, I can see this talking to my Indian friends. Like, they're so optimistic about the future because, like, they have such incredible tools at, in, at their hands that weren't just possible, like, even a few years ago. And, um, and also, like, they also see this quality of their lives improving in their lifetime much more than, than like, people in the West do. So... I don't think like people will have to demand equality. Like they will just come and take it, and that's a good thing. That's yeah, yeah, I, I agree. That's that's a fair point. Um, yeah, but anyway, that's that's what I'm telling myself about uh, possibly the um, the shift that we're seeing in in some economies, mainly in America, but also in like traditionally Western countries, and I include in Israel in that. Um, so then I definitely feel less bad about it because I have a broader picture of, hey, globally, this is a this is quite a good movement. Like, why should the wealth be all um, kind of funneled into this one area of the world? And it makes me, 
you know, feel not as bad with the fact that, uh, well, things are here in Israel are getting out of control and I can't really hope to buy my own house with even a, a decent salary. You know? Oh, you should come to Poland. Like the houses are cheaper here. <laughs> well, what about the weather? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah the, wi- the winter is pretty challenging, I would say. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I, like I'm surprised like more people aren't taking advantage of like this remote job opportunities around the world so for example like my husband and i make money in the u.s and we live in poland and this is like the best deal ever and most of our friends here in poland aren't doing it and i I can't figure out why like it's yeah it's it's this equalizing equalizing process that you just mentioned you take money out of the u.s and you spend it here in Poland, fueling the local economy. And also the quality of life can be pretty amazing just because, yeah, you're making money in a richer country and spending it in a a cheaper one. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, yeah, that's that's exactly what what I'm talking about. Um, Yeah, that's how do you see, um, what do you see else that is connected with um, setting intentions and, uh, living well, that an area that maybe we haven't explored around this uh, concept. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so one thing that is on my mind lately is technology and especially like what kind of relationship with technology I want to model for my child. Because like before I had a kid, I was like, yeah, it's all amazing. You can code stuff. You can make things happen in the world. And and yeah, to me, coding is magic. Like you basically type in some magic spells, and then things happen. Like the right. light goes on in my living room, or I can play some music by just saying a phrase. And my great grandmother would be like shocked when she saw that. It's but, a ghost. Yeah, it's a ghost. <laughs> but also, like with these magic powers comes great responsibility, and you can use the same technology just to get yourself addicted to scrolling depressing news and and yeah just like <laughs> sitting like a zombie on the couch and watching this stream of hor- horrible things happening all, of, all over the world and especially like now that we have a kid and I see like how tempting it is for her to watch videos on YouTube and how hard it is for her to stop I can't really blame her because it's equally hard for me to stop scrolling Twitter, especially when I'm in a bad mood. Mm. So some of my friends are like, yeah, technology is wrong and we should ban it. And especially we should ban it for kids and teenagers because like they're not grown enough yet to make use of it. And a part of me is like, well, no, like this is the future. Like the the skills the kids are going to learn while like coding or editing videos or like making things on the internet, this is going to be their future. This is going to be their jobs. That's how they're going to make a living and make a difference in the world. But at the same time, like there are so many different attention traps set on the on the way to getting there. And this reminds me of, of something a wise friend when, once told me that intention is the only difference between a tool and a weapon. Like you can kill someone with a kitchen knife or you can make a mm. sandwich using it. Mm. So, so like, especially like when you do scientific studies, when if something is go- good or bad or right or wrong, it can't really measure what intentions people have using this tool or like doing this right. thing. Because, yeah, intention is like all very subjective and internal and and personal so if you like <laughs> try to study a hundred people using computers when they're five year old it won't necessarily tell you like what's the, their intention when when using these computers and th- their outcomes might be like so vastly different depending on it yeah no that's that's a really interesting point that you're raising first of all i think that the generation that's most addicted to the phone is like my dad's generation uh, really it's like um yeah i see more older people addicted to their phone than than some other people and i think that uh, it's very possible that for our children 
actually the algorithms are not going to be as uh, powerful on their brains because they grew up with it. And with education, they could be better equipped from a young age because they've been there. They might get bored with it much easier than our brains have kind of uh, just stumbled on this thing. Um, mm-hmm. in, in our cases, young people, but for adults and in, in even older people. Um, I also want to say that I think intention there is key because this seems to be a, a good question to ask yourselves as all, at, at all times, right? It's like, what is my intention doing this thing? Because then you can really very much at once recognize that you've been hijacked by something. <laughs> it's like, hey, I'm actually doing this thing without any sort of intention. It's like, what am I doing, right? And this is uh, what I think you mentioned before, like rationalization. Yeah, we can rationalize things, but that's not the point. If you rationalize things, but you recognize that you didn't have an intention when you engaged in that activity, that is still problematic. Even if you manage to find some sort of explanation that says, oh, but I just learned this thing or like, you know, the the 30th tweet that I came across (laughs) was actually like something uh, not half bad. Yeah, but um, if you had intention, you would probably search for that thing, recognizing that you wanted to learn about this field or that thing or anything like that. Yeah, it's also hard because of serendipity. Like sometimes you stumble across things you wouldn't have known possible if it wasn't for this like aimless wandering sometimes. But yeah, I, I totally agree about your point on Twitter. Like I... Twitter is the best and the worst thing that happened to me. Yeah. Like maybe yeah. except for my family. <laughs> I love Twitter and sometimes I hate it at the same time because it, it takes so much of my time and attention and uh, and just like open mind loops. And, you know, like I found my job through Twitter. I found so many friends through Twitter. I, I came on this podcast through Twitter. Yeah. But like every once or twice a year, I need to take a month long break from it just to like reset my addiction levels <laughs> and to like, and whenever I do it, I'm so peaceful and calm and I have so much time for everything else. And I, I write long form blog posts, which I don't really have time for doing it otherwise. But but still, like there's huge value that I get out of Twitter and I don't want to quit it completely and I can't seem to figure out like a healthy relationship with it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I agree 100%. And sometimes I'm thinking, oh, you know, I wish I was better at Twitter. Like I would get uh, even more followers and have more impact. And then I'm thinking, it's like, no, it's probably a good thing that I kind of suck at it and I haven't, I, <laughs> I don't know how to um, appease the algo because then it might make me a complete lunatic and I would have to, <laughs> yeah, to go to a retreat for half a year or something. So I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad this hasn't happened to me. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think that from this conversation, it's, it's, uh, it's really opened up my mind about intentions and the, the importance of them, because I think if people listening want to kind of sit with themselves for a while and really think about the direction that they want to go in, in more abstract terms than goals. I think that is super useful. And for me, that is the, the whole thing that allowed this podcast to happen, you know, because Mm -hmm. my intention is to um, enjoy well-being, living in this life, uh, living well. And this podcast is just the tool that I fashioned to do it with. So hopefully I can, get people to think about uh, ideas in a, in a new way. If they're exposed to them here, it helps me because I get my fill of amazing conversations with amazing people. And, you know, hopefully uh, my guests are also having fun and maybe their ideas get built upon, which is uh, my hope that uh, this was something that's happened here today. Yes, for sure. Yeah, thanks for having me here. And this helped me clarify my thoughts around goals and intentions a lot. 
because yeah as you mentioned a goal is like a fixed thing that you want to get well you mentioned it <laughs> we came there together yeah. that <laughs> that's the best part of being here yeah absolutely uh before we before we part ways what do you um want to w- What can you tell uh, listeners about what you're doing and where you can be found online? Mm-hmm. So I work at Interintellect, facilitating the most friendly and open-minded conversations on the internet. And you can find me on Twitter, <laughs> as I mentioned. And oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that's probably where it's best to get in touch. Amazing, Maria. Well, this has been a pleasure. And yeah, interle- Interintellect has been mentioned on previous episodes. So I'm going to link to that. I'm going to be hosting salons there as well. And uh, I'm very happy that we'll get to see each other uh, soon again on a call like that. Yeah. So, thank you. See you again. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Leia. This is great.